Okay, welcome uh, to today's lecture. Uh, I managed to get to Växjö today as well. Um, however, next week I will probably not because we have oral hearing week in Kalmar. Uh, so I will probably pre-record one of the lectures next week and uh, have one recording since last year because that is accurate still. Uh, so let's go over just a few things. I will not get into details. Probably all of you, or more or less, did the hand-in of the examination uh, assignment this Friday, last Friday. Uh, I, I, I would like to stress that please, please, please read the instructions because it says really clear what to do, uh, how to hand in uh, the examination assignment uh, that is the same for all assignments in the course so so if you if you did it on this one uh, you will be sure to have done it or you will do it the right way uh, on the other ones as well uh, you are supposed to hand in the code on the repositories given to you on the organ organization 1db525 on github not your own repositories because then we have no no follow-up at, at all so we really need you to, to, to use the, the repos that we have generated for you. Uh, last week we also had this three week rule thing. So uh, I think Mats is uh, removing inactive students from the course right now. Uh, that is uh, students that are have, have not made a commit yet. So, so, so if you've made a commit you're safe, but if you haven't then you will probably be uh, unregistered today. Uh, if you are uh, and you want to complete the course, please contact us. Um, but if you haven't done a commit yet, four weeks into the course, with five weeks to go, uh, you are probably behind quite a bit. Um, today we will transition to part two in the course, the client-side JavaScript. This is when it's getting exciting. Uh, it's, uh, everything leading up to now has just been like preparing for this part. Um, so the fun starts now and today I will have the lecture five and six. The, uh, the reason those are grayed out is that there are some references that I will update. Uh, and I've just updated the lecture, um, uh, the pre presentation for, for the fifth lecture. So, so if you're following along you can uh, bring up the presentation. Uh, it's ac uh, accurate, I think. Um, so probably lecture seven and eight will be pre-recorded, so that you know. That means that if if you want to be ahead, don't wait with lect lecture seven and eight until next week. You could probably squeeze them in this week if you like, uh, and start working on uh, the exercises and start working on the assignment. So first of all, I recommend you all to do the exercises in the course. So the, the exercises are kind of designed so that if you do the, the exercises, you get all the tools for creating the assign, assignment or creating the application uh, in the assignment. If you feel stressed and out of time and just skip all the exercises, well, you're allowed to, we will not have anything to say about that but the examination will be quite hard then I think so please do the exercises and the exercises that is nothing you need to hand in or show us or anything like that it's for your own eyes only uh, there are like six or seven seven exercises they are graded with a level and a level is like the bare minimum and the basics. So please do all the A level uh, uh, exercises. Even I would say the B level exercises are quite important to, to finish the, the examination exercise. Uh, and we don't have any C, <laughs> uh, C level yet, but there might be, and that is kind of extra. If, if, if one C level will show up, it's, it's more or less extra. In that case, for all the, uh, not all, but for many of, of the, the uh, exercises, uh, you will get an extended recording, a demo, where I um, uh, solve that exercise from the start to the end. 
so, so you can follow along. So I will not code as so much on, on the lectures to come. Instead, I will please recommend you to watch the, the recordings because then you get my view on how, how to write the code. Of course, you can have a different view and, and you're uh, free to do so. But, but if, if, you, if you want one way ahead, then you could watch the recordings. Um, and I kind of show the development tools and stuff like that in those recordings. Um, there are some, I mean, some are a couple of years old. Most of them I recorded last year. I will record some new this year as well. Um, I've made, there are no big differences, but there are some differences that uh, comes down to how uh, the development environment is set up. We are using Webpack in this course. Uh, I will introduce something called ECMAScript modules today that kind of eliminates the need for Webpack. However, we are using Webpack still, and I will uh, talk to you about that um, later on. Um, so just be aware when you watch the demos that what I say on this lecture is more uh, how you're supposed to do it. All the ex uh, exercises are updated with the latest code, so please just go ahead and start start doing them. Uh, you get the instructions for each and every exercise in its repository. So, so it has a readme and the readme will kind of say what to do. Okay. And the deadline for the examination. This one is grayed out as well. I have some minor bug fixes to do in this one coming down to the requirements because the requirements ha have some leaks in them. So if, you're, if you want the minimal path, there are some, uh, some ways of, of, of getting past some of the requirements and I will kind of fix those. But otherwise it's the same assignment and it should be up and running. So you are able to start on this one now if you like. Um, deadline, 10th of October. And that is actually the same day as we have the oral hearings. So you need to, to, to have submitted your code at latest 7.30, the same day as the oral hearings. And I will get back to you on how to book oral hearings as well. Questions regarding the course in, in general? Okay, then we will dive into today's topic and today's topic is the browser and JavaScript. Um, so last week, we talked about JavaScript, but more like the, the, the language JavaScript and, and getting you up to speed with constructions in the language, syntax, and how, how to write JavaScript in general. Today we will transition to the browser uh, and talk about how to implement JavaScript in the browser. And the browser is probably the, the most common environment for, for JavaScripts to be executed, even though the, the server environment with Node is, is quite popular as well. Um, and it was in the browser that it all started. Uh, so today we will have a look at the browser and we will have a look at components in, inside of the browser to be able to understand how JavaScript is, is, is working together with HTML and CSS. Uh, we will have some look at the development tools uh, as well. Just a quick look. I think I have some references that you can check out if you would want a deeper look into dev development tools in the browser. Uh, and then we will transition and start working with JavaScript in the browser and uh, just, just getting started with it and how, how, where to write, uh, write our scripts and what differs JavaScript in the browser from, ad from other environments. I might have said this before. Oh, sorry, I will change the view to that one, maybe. Yay. Um, Douglas Crockford, I talked about him last week. Be, he's, he's been kind of an evangelist for, for JavaScript, or has been at least. Uh, he is now working at PayPal, I think. And the reason he chose PayPal was that they said he could do whatever he liked there. So, so he kind of is employed at PayPal, but he's doing whatever he likes. Uh, he said this, the browser is a really hostile programming environment. And, and you will find out that 
if you're used to Java, C Sharp or whatever other environment, you are kind of in control as a developer. You know what version of Java is running and you can compile your code to run in that version and everything is fine and you will know that, okay, as long as this version of Java is present, it will, everything will work out fine. However, in the browser, uh, we have this kind of openness. So everything is open standard, uh, meaning that we have a lot of different browser manufacturers. With all of those browser manufacturers comes different bugs, different implementations, especially if you go back a few years in time, uh, where kind of Internet Explorer or Microsoft did it their way and other browsers another way. Uh, today, all browsers are kind of equal in when they support something, they often support it in the same way because the standards are much better written today and, and error handling and stuff are, are all more controlled. However, there are still problems with compatibility that some browsers are not supporting all the new features in the language. Uh, and I'll have more discussion about this later on, but uh, just bear in mind that when you are developing for a browser, if it works for you, it might not be the same if you're in a phone or if you're in an other desktop computer or wherever this code is, is being uh, executed. Uh, and one thing with the web as well is that a lot of sites are built upon the notion of, of including frameworks and, and uh, uh, libraries from many different vendors. And to get those working together without bugs has also been quite a problem, at least before. Now we have better package handling and better modules in the browser, but that was also a big problem, especially a couple of years ago. But we will try to get through that in this course, or at least have a look at it. So. I showed this picture before. This is, I, I, I actually talked to a developer at Meridium, that is a, a, a company in Kalmar, quite the big company. Uh, and he had, he, the, the guy I talked to, he, he's working with web because everybody's working with web in some way. Uh, and he had been hiring uh, uh, Java developers with no prior experience to the web. And what he said was that, the most difficult problem to overcome is the notion of the server and the client model. That, that you're so used to think in, in like one monolith application that it's hard to, 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 to imagine code running on the server and the client and, and how these interact and how you can have latency between calls and stuff like that. So it's really, really important that we think about where the code is executed. So from now on, we well, all code we write will execute in the browser on the client. The code I wrote last week was actually executed on the server or in the Node.js environment. However, from this day on, everything we do is in the browser. Uh, of course, you will kind of fetch things from the server. In some cases, I've written servers that you will communicate through for, for making chats and the second assignment, for instance, where all uh, the second assignment is a, a simple a qu question. What's it called? Poll? No, quiz. A quiz application. So you get a question, and the user should answer that question. Uh, you have a timer, and then you click next. Then you get a new question. The user answers that question, and all of those questions are served from the server to your application in the client. So there is no way of of like looking in the code on the client and finding all the answers because the an answers and the questions are not present in the browser. They are being served from the server. Um, of course, you, you will not write the code on the server. You will focus on the client. But in the other course, the next one, 1db523, we focus on the server instead of writing server applications for those of you taking that course. Okay, now we're in the browser. Um, yeah. Which browsers do you use? So, just a simple uh, uh, hand, hands up for Firefox. Okay, Chrome. Yeah, Safari. No, Internet Explorer. 
Ah, well, come on. <laughs> Edge. Yeah. Uh, Opera. Yeah. Tour browser or some kind of no? anonymous. Brave. Yeah, Brave, the lion. yeah the Lion thing with, uh, yeah, I've, I've been testing it out. I think it's a Firefox uh, fork, yeah. Any other browser I've missed? Anyone using the Samsung browser in the phone? Having like a Galaxy 8 or something like that, yeah. Uh, is it different browsers? in phone versus desktop, or are you using the same browser in both? Those of you who are using the same browser, desktop and mobile, hands up. Okay, those of you, uh, yeah, and the rest of you are, are switching. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let, let's just have a look at, at some numbers because it could be quite interesting. Oh my God, it didn't fit, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, most of you uh, put your hand up with, with uh, 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 Chrome and it's being the most popular browser by far almost 70% worldwide usage this statistics is and that is gone as well below the horizon but it's the global stats uh, global stat counter or something like that it's called so always beware when it comes to statistics of, of course this I think they measure on quite a lot of sites and I've found this quite accurate over the years. But of course, if you, if you were to, to, to look at browser support on a developer site, for instance, GitHub, this will change dramatically because developers go to GitHub. But I think this is quite an, uh, a fair representation of, of the percentages. Um, so it's also interesting to, to see Sweden because that is the context many of us are developing in. Uh, Chrome being not that popular in Sweden, however, Internet Explorer is being a little bit more uh, popular. And I guess this is uh, to, due to many IT companies in Sweden being, or companies in Sweden adopting uh, web technologies quite early on. And they are now sitting in a lot of old systems that only run in Internet Explorer. So they are kind of forced to still use in Internet Explorer. That will probably change. Those numbers are dropping each year. It was 14% last year. So give it a couple of years. And I think Internet Explorer will be gone totally. But it's still there. 10% in Sweden. That is actually quite a lot. Um, anyone know that one? No, uh, but it's Alibaba, uh, uh, the, the, the big Asian company. It has its own browser. And oh, I, I, I didn't say, but uh, inside of the parentheses is the mobile uh, uh, numbers. Uh, once again. Okay, so, so it's good for, for browsers without JavaScript support, yeah or phones without, uh, that don't need JavaScript. Uh, we will not look especially on that one. UC browser, I think it's called actually, UC. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, Firefox being 11%, uh, yeah, you can see the numbers for yourself. Opera, getting lower and lower for each year. At Edge, the new Microsoft browser is gaining ground slowly. I guess some are transitioning from Internet Explorer to Edge. Down below is Samsung, not being showed. Uh, of course, it has uh, nothing on a desktop, but on mobile, I think it's like three or four percent, something like that, uh, in that area. Uh, noticeable is that there are some things differing Sweden from, from worldwide, and it comes to mobile browsers especially and it, uh, re it's regarding Safari. So, so uh, iPhones has always been quite popular in Sweden uh, and this is shown in those numbers. So, so Safari having, uh, or iPhones or Apple having like 20% of the mo global mobile market, but in Sweden it's, it's closer to 50. So uh, it's quite a different difference there. What would I recommend? I wouldn't recommend anything. I, I would actually recommend trying out different browsers and, and switch. <laughs> yeah, yes, to, 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 to get a feeling for, for different browsers. Uh, we will 
look at this is kind of only branding so it's more interesting to look under the hood and see what kind of uh, engines are, are those browsers running and some are sharing engines uh, so I would say developers tend to, to, to have used Firefox a lot and many have switched to Chrome yeah Okay, so, so the UC has some kind of um, um, support for playing games on desktop or? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, 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 so that, that is more or less a, a small operating system in, in a way that, that you could have like application specific for that one. Yeah, that, that, that has proven quite a bad idea through the years uh, I mean we Internet Explorer tried it with it's like com components and stuff and it kind of didn't work out so so probably most of those big browsers are quite into following standards and not doing things on their own from now on uh, without changing the standard before uh, they might try things out but they are often uh, trying to get that into the standard. Oprah being one of those that kind of drives some, some areas uh, and experiments a lot. Uh, the reason Firefox was really uh, popular back in the days, if we go back 10 years, it was that it was the first browser that supported or had plugins that supported uh, debugging in, in the browser in a, in, a, in a good and structured way using a, a, a plugin called Firebird. Fire, fire, Firebird, I think. Firebug, Firebug. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, rec I, I repeat for the mic. Uh, so, so, so the company says sometimes Firefox is faster, uh, start boot up times wh when you start a computer, and memory handling might be better in Firefox sometimes, but then Chrome might be better in some way. I mean, it's a, it's a constant race. Uh, and especially the race is on when it comes to executing JavaScript in an efficient way. So the amount of money and effort being used to optimize the JavaScript engines are really, really big. The, I mean, they are doing a lot, a lot of things. I will, I will get into this, but I have a reference to a talk on, on Nordic JS. I think it was last year, uh, where they compared C++ to uh, JavaScript in the browser. And in certain applications, JavaScript was actually faster, which is quite nice since JavaScript often is, I mean, it's C++ in the background anyways, uh, um, but, but for certain operations, JavaScript is, is really fast today. It wasn't 15 years ago, but today doing calculations and stuff, JavaScript could be really fast. And that comes down to optimizations in the browser's JavaScript engines being the driver for this. Uh, but we will have a look at that soon. Uh, just some words about compatibility. I will not, like on every API call, I will not stand here and, and, and uh, teach you which browser support what because it's changing all the time. There are actually techniques that I couldn't teach last year that are, are supported mainly uh, in, in all browsers today, just a year later. So, so, so that kind of knowledge is kind of something you need to update yourself with every day when working on the web. Uh, however, I will recommend caniuse.com. We have had a look at that before. So please use it if you're uncertain for a s specific uh, API call, for instance, you can use can I use and you can see which browsers support that API call. Also, make sure you use developermozilla.org. I've recommended it a lot. Uh, you will see a compatibility chart on all uh, uh, methods and uh, classes and types uh, there as well. And there are probably better sources out there. Uh, okay. Let's head into the browser then uh, and look at the, I mean, 
as I said, Chrome and, and uh, Internet Explorer, that's only branding, more or less. The more interesting parts is what is beneath the surface and what is building, building the browser. And I've made this distinct distinction of components in the browser. This is from a conference paper. Uh, it's the best one I've found, uh, uh, just concerning the different parts of the browser. And this is good enough, I think. So we have some kind of user interface, of course. I mean, address bars and uh, buttons and all, all, all the things that you see, scroll bars and things like that. That is often one of the things that are quite commonly changed uh, with branding that you, you, I think Chrome on, on Mac at least did an update last couple of days ago and, and changed the UI completely. Uh, we have a, something called browser and rendering engines. And browser and rendering engines is, is the one that is responsible for parsing, re retrieving and parsing the HTML and CSS. Uh, and also uh, calling the JavaScript engine when needed. The JavaScript engine being the um, just-in-time just in compiler, compiler, interpreter for JavaScript. A couple of years ago, or five and ten years ago, we could say that JavaScript was an interpreted language, that it was like just in interpreted in real time as, as it was uh, uh, executed from, from code to the running uh, or the execution. However, in, in uh, the later years, this has changed. So you cannot say that JavaScript is, is barely an interpreted language. It's also a com uh, compiled language. Many parts of your code will be compiled in the background without you knowing it, just for optimization. Um, could be quite good to know. Nothing that you should really need to worry about when you are developing, but it could be good to know. We have a network layer. This one is responsible for all uh, network traffic and, and fetching things from the server, opening socket connections and, and, and things like that. And we have data persistence layer as well. You being able to store things uh, in the browser. This typically being cookies. Today we have much better ways of storing things in the browser like web storage and even a cache to be able to control what is cached in the browser and what is not. Maybe you want to cache some images so you don't need to load them over and over again. You can control that in a really, really good manner uh, today. Okay, this is a graphical uh, illustration of those components. Uh, not, not much to say about this, more than those two, the browser engine and the rendering engine, depending on where you read, you will s those will sometimes together be called the browser engine and sometimes they are divided into the browser engine and the rendering engine. And the dis distinction being browser engine being the composer that like looks, oh, we have a, a JavaScript and then we have a CSS file. Oh, I should fetch the image and just, just doing that work. And the rendering engine looking at the specific code, fixing your errors if you have made errors in the HTML. Remember, if you write full C HTML, the browser will fix it for you. That being one of the jobs for, uh, for the rendering engine. And just preparing everything for the UE backend to plot it on the screen with dots, more or less. So this is pretty much where a lot of HTML and CSS magic is happening. And in the JavaScript engine, of course, all the JavaScript is executed. And we will, in this course, mainly focus on the yellow one, the JavaScript engine, because, well, that's where our code will be executed. I'll skip that one. So looking at the browsers once again, uh, those are the uh, components names. Uh, many of them open sourced. So if we look at, uh, for instance, uh, Chrome, uh, we can see that both Chrome and Opera are uh, using the browser rendering engine called Blink. Um, Google used to use WebKit 
if we go back, I think like four or five years ago, uh, Safari and Chrome both used WebKit. However, Apple and Google couldn't get along. Uh, so Safari wanted to have WebKit like really, really stable and backwards compatible with, with old legacy code. However, the Google development team wanted a more progressive approach. Uh, so they, they split, uh, split that project. WebKit is an open source project, so, so anyone can, and Blink as well. So anyone could, could participate, of course, and everyone can fork, and, and they did a fork. And I think when doing that fork, they removed a lot of code. Uh, from uh, from WebKit, uh, so I think Blink, at least then, was quite a bit smaller uh, in in uh, in the, the the number of rows of code, at least. Uh, when that happened, Opera abandoned their own uh, rendering and JavaScript engine and jumped on to the same engine as Chrome, uh, that being Blink for the rendering engine and the V8. JavaScript engine. And V8 is the, probably the most known JavaScript engine. Um, it's open source and it's the one that Brian Dahl used uh, when he created Node, uh, the server version uh, of, of uh, running JavaScript on the server basically. Uh, so, so it's V8 being the JavaScript engine in both cases. However, it's different it's not exactly the same engine. I mean, there are forks of this, of course, but more or less, uh, it's more or less the same, at least. You see the names, something else to say, well, if you, if you were to, for instance, so, so the rendering engine for, for Firefox is Gecko. And if you were to op if if you had a web server and you got a call from a internet explorer browser and you could always get information about the browser because the browser sends information amongst other things which browser rendering engine is, is being used so when internet explorer is calling a server it should say trident because that is the rendering en engine however it doesn't it says gecko and that is quite strange because Internet Explorer has never had Gecko implemented as a rendering engine. Still, it identifies itself as a Gecko browser. And this is, <laughs> first of all, one reason why it's really hard to, to, to trust <laughs> uh, the browsers when, when it comes to the server and knowing what browser it actually is. But this is due to the old browser wars when when firefox and or in that case netscape netscape and and, and internet explorer and microsoft fight it for 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 getting uh, the control over the web what happened was i think i've mentioned this before but what happened was that oh they they tried to implement a lot of cool stuff into the browser so so that the developers would shift and use their browser instead so oh now microsoft has implemented blink yay all the developers wanted to use blinking text so they they switched to internet explorer uh, however many developers developed sites that would only work in netscape that used gecko what the developers did then was to be able uh, to be sure that it wasn't an Internet Explorer that tried to run this code and, and that would break because Internet Explorer didn't support some of the, those things that the developers did. They had a simple if statement. So if this browser rendering engine contains Gecko, okay, fine, let it through. If it's not, just, just show a please switch to, to Netscape uh, sign instead. But when Internet Explorer matured and started to uh, support the same features as Gecko, they were not let in on those sites because they were not a Gecko browser. So, so they did the obvious thing and, and they added Gecko to their rendering engine uh, signature. So they were let in on, on those sites. And that's why still later versions of Internet Explorer has this Gecko thing to not break old websites that still rely on, on that old code. Of course, this is a, a terrible way of doing 
uh, what is called like browser detection. So, so you detect what browser it is and you make choice depending on browser vendor. That is a terrible way of, of, of handling compatibility. What you're supposed to do is to check for feature detection. So, so if a browser supports a certain feature, then you can serve that content. Otherwise you have a backup. So that is kind of browser detection versus feature detection. Um, okay. Uh, what you would need to know <laughs> is, is that V8 is a JavaScript engine because that is like the JavaScript engine. But remember, there are others. You don't need to memorize those. Uh, it's also good to know that Opera and Chrome is using the same rendering engine. Hence, you shouldn't need to test your HTML and CSS in both browsers. It should always look the same. But the UI being different could be good to test anyways if, if, you, if you're developing a big site. Okay, questions? Or well, we will move on to Uh, why we have JavaScript in the browser. Uh, why is JavaScript in the browser? Because of reason. Uh, we need to still go back to 1995 uh, and uh, oh, I haven't told this story in a couple of years. So, so I hope I'm, I'm not uh, saying this wrong. It could be, I've, I'm pretty sure with that we are uh, in Netscape territory. So Netscape wanted an advantage over uh, Internet Explorer and they wanted to be able to run code in the browser. Instead of just showing information that was common back in 1995, they wanted an overhand in, in being able to execute code in the browser. Another initiative called ja Java Applets was being introduced. Uh, Java Applets being Java code being run in the browser in a, uh, um, a separate sandbox. Uh, however, it was quite cumbersome to, to work with. It was really not, it was more or less a plugin with like a box where you could run code instead of integrating the code into the page itself. Uh, so Brendan Eich being, I think, a developer at Xerox back in, back in the days, he got the, the question to if he could implement the language into the browser, in the Netscape browser. Uh, uh, and he, he was actually constructing languages, so he thought it was quite a neat challenge. Uh, so he started working uh, with a new language uh, that he called LiveScript uh, and that um, actually had its roots in Scheme or Lisp. I don't really remember, or both, but in a totally different stem than or Java and C Sharp and, and those languages. So, so Scheme is, is quite different. It's a functional language. Uh, so he started to developing that language and he showed it for the executives or whoever made the decisions. And they say, said kind of, but this doesn't look like Java because Java was, was really, really the thing back in the 90s. And he said, no, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, a it's a totally different language. No, but we need to have it to look like Java because otherwise the developers will be frightened. They, they will not know how to develop in this language you constructed. It must look like Java. Okay, so back to the drawing board and he redesigned the language so that it's actually a functional language in the, uh, uh, if, if you look uh, beyond the, the syntax. However, the syntax is kind of like Java. And, and you know that now because you have programmed or, or, or looked some at JavaScript. And I know, you know, a, an if statement is an if statement, a for loop is a for loop. It's, it's kind of the same. Um, and that's why. And they even named it JavaScript just to get a little bit on the brighter side uh, because everybody liked Java. Uh, and that was fine because when Sun had the, uh, I think it was Sun back in the 90s that owned Java and they gave the blessing to calling it a Java script. That was fine with Sun. But that was in Netscape. And Sun and Netscape, they had some kind of relationship, I don't remember. However, when Microsoft saw this initiative, 
they thought, oh, we also would like to uh, implement uh, JavaScript in, in Internet Explorer. So what they did was reverse engineered uh, JavaScript from Netscape. And they here they did a pretty good job because they reverse engineered everything, every error, every fault thing in the language they reverse engineered. Uh, but they couldn't call it JavaScript because Sun owned the brand Java. So they had to call it JScript. So in the 90s we had JavaScript that we had a name LiveScript floating around because that was the f initial uh, name and then we had JScript that was Microsoft's version that was totally the same thing. But then they started to divide Microsoft having quite a pragmatic view on how to program on the web. Uh, they in many cases did their own thing while uh, Netscape more worked with a standard committee and, and tried to, to, to do it that way. Uh, so 15 or 20 years ago the community was really divided. It was really hard to program for the web because we had JScript, we had JavaScript. JScript had some uh, implementations that wasn't supported in, in JavaScript and, and, and back and forth. Uh, However, uh, that is long gone and today JavaScript or ECMAScript, that is the standard uh, name, uh, is uh, uh, being implemented with new features coming and being released each and every year. So to this year it's ECMAScript 2018. No big news in that one, but some releases are bigger than others. ECMAScript 2015 being the big uh, release where many things changed. Um, uh, but what do we need JavaScript for in the browser? Well, if we, haven't, if we ha have no JavaScript in the browser, a web page is more or less only an information servant. Serving documents, linking to other documents, maybe showing images. Th but that is pretty much what the web would look like. However, you know that the web is so much more today. Uh, I mean, look at Netflix, Facebook, Google. I mean, each and every of those application platforms are quite uh, neat today. I mean, there is, in many cases, they are web only even. So, so looking at Slack, for instance, that is a web only application. Well, it's implemented in the phones and in, in the browser, but that is just using the web uh, application in the background and, and just presenting it as a browser app or as a phone app or as a uh, electron app on, on, on the PC. So today you can do more or less anything in JavaScript in the browser. Um, you can run application and games. We have APIs for accessing graphic cards so you can do quite a lot with those APIs. It's not a replacement for, for C++ yet. However, there is an initiative called WebAssembly that, uh, is, uh, that you could actually write your games in C++ and convert them to, to WebAssembly and you could run them pretty natively in the browser as well. Uh, we could yeah, do things like live updates from the server. Uh, we can work with uh, uh, VR and AR in the browser. We can, we can do most things that you need. And I mean, Chromebook is probably the, and that is Google's initiative to, to show that web, the web is actually a platform. It's not just a browser anymore. It's, it's, it's a platform. So go, the Chromebook, you probably know it, but the Chromebook is more or less only a browser just running web applications. Well, it supports Java uh, or Android applications now as well, but, but it's still an initiative to, to show the power of the web. Um, when we start, of start writing JavaScript, I will try to enforce this structure that we separate the structure, that being HTML, from the presentation, that being from the behavior, that being JavaScript. So we're adding this last one, we'll, we're adding behavior to the structure and presentation. So the, the, the first assignment was you 
using HTML and CSS and just creating a simple presentation page. And now we're adding JavaScript to this to make things happen. And you can make whatever you, th you can come up with happen using JavaScript. You can move things around, you can change colors, you can make new text appear, remove text that is no longer used. Um, you can change e each and every style attribute. So anything you can do with CSS, you can use dynamically with JavaScript as well, telling the CSS to update itself. Um, and on top of that, we have a lot of APIs that we could use as well. I will have a separate lecture on that in the end of the course, but we have APIs, for instance, in, in the phone, you have a APIs to, to find out the percentage of the battery. You have an API to find all or get all contacts in the contact books. You have an API to, to, to start the camera, to, to start the microphone. You have APIs for more or less everything for the gyroscope, for instance, if, if, you, if you want to make a game uh, using the gyroscope. Um, yeah, so that is pretty much it. Um, this, this last thing before the break, um, what is important to know and a big distinction between running JavaScript in a browser compared to running a Java application in Windows, for instance, is that JavaScript is heavily sandboxed. And with that, I mean, if you were to just visit the page, that page can start running an application in your computer because that is JavaScript basically. So think, f think that, so if you're just randomly surfing the web, you're coming to a web page that starts an application. If that application had unlimited rights on your computer, it would be really dangerous because it will be able to start the camera, listen on the microphone, start changing files on your file system, it could do whatever it, it liked. Uh, in the browser, it's not like that. We need restrictions because otherwise, whoa, uh, it wouldn't be good. So, so for instance, JavaScript cannot read from the local file system. Well, there is an API for that soon as well. But you can you cannot like just start a file reader and read a file like you can in Java. You cannot do that in JavaScript. It's not allowed. Uh, there are certain APIs that you can access, but you can't access them without the user permission. And you probably know this, especially if you have a phone, because the phones are kind of designed the same way. So so if you try to use the webcam, the user will get a question: Is it okay to start the cam? And the user clicks. OK or deny. Uh, you need to know that because if the user denies, you need to have a backup plan. OK, so the user were sh should take a profile picture of itself. OK, it didn't want to, to share its camera. Well, make the user upload an image then instead or something like that. So you always need fallbacks f for using certain APIs. And this is location is one of those examples. The browser can. F JavaScript can access the user location, the GPS positioning. However, the user must click OK for JavaScript to be able to do that. Uh, communication with third-party servers is kind of restricted. Uh, however, there are something called course cross-origin resource sharing that allows uh, you to, to communicate with other servers. Uh, and we will look into this when we start working with asynchronous communications. Uh, is it possible to bypass those permissions? No, then it's a b bug in the browser. So, so uh, you always need to ask the user for permission. However, the user can, like for location, for instance, the user can say always, uh, always provide location for this site. <laughs> yeah, so so some kind of conspiracy theory going on, and uh, it, yeah, but remember, are those web applications you're talking about, or is it? I mean, if you have a, a, a installed, if 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 an application can be installed on your computer as as a regular application, then it's 
more dan dangerous. However, as long as it is run in the web browser, it's sandboxed. Uh, how, however, the, la the last Mac OS, Mojave, 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 Mojave. Uh, I think it's starting to utilize this permission uh, control uh, uh, for installed applications as well. For instance, if, if in Mojave, if, if an application needs the camera, the application needs to, to ask the user for permission. So that is becoming a thing on desktop computers as well. But if you're able to, to, to bypass some of those APIs permission uh, handling, then there is a serious bug in that browser and yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah, just an example before the break, you probably can't see, but that is a link, a blue link, that indicating that this is a clickable link. If you, I, I mean, I said you can do whatever you like with JavaScript. You can change colors, you can find out colors of stuff, but there is an exception. You cannot find the color of a link with JavaScript. You cannot read. It's a write only. You can, can never read the color of a link. You know why? And that could be quite strange as a developer. You're like, why can't I get, why can't I get the color? It's the most obvious thing. You try with a P element, works. You try with an A element, doesn't work. Because the color of the link indicates if you have visited the site or not. So you could, there were actually websites that, that just listed a lot of, of other sites. And then it looped all those links and checked for uh, purple colors on the links. And if the color was purple, then the user has visited that page. And you could more or less find out which pages the user had visited and not on the web. Okay, you need to pinpoint each and every one of, of those pages, but it is still an integr integrity problem. And you can find things like this throughout JavaScript. So remember, if, if you're trying to do something sneaky, and that is not possible, but it kind of should be, it's probably due to some kind of restriction in the browser. So just have that in mind when, you, you, when you're programming in the, in, in, for the web. Starting to write JavaScript in the browser. Uh, and this is, so I will, this is one of the things I changed La late last night. So this is kind of up to date. Uh, and this is due to the fact that ECMAScript modules wasn't supported in a good way in browsers last year, but they are this year. Uh, so I will kind of show you how JavaScript was implemented in the browser before ECMAScript modules or ESM modules or ESM and after ESM. And in the course, we will use ECMAScript modules. Uh, it will make life easier for you. And as long as you're coding in a fairly modern browser, that will pose no problems. Okay, so, but we start off, start off with the old recommendation. I think this is how they do it in the book as well, even though they mentioned that you could do it with ESM. You recognize this, this is a simple HTML page. Nothing strange here. If you like, you have uh, linked some uh, 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 style sheets, for instance, in the head. You have a section with content. And then we would like to add JavaScript to this mix. You can add JavaScript in many different ways. Uh, you can more or less exactly the same ways that you can do with, with, script, uh, with the styles. So with styles, you can add a style on a tag, just saying the p tag has the style attribute red. We went over this and said that is not a good idea because it will be really hard to, to maintain that code. Uh, you will duplicate code a lot. It's the same thing with JavaScript. You can add JavaScript on HTML elements, but you really should not. So, so I will not even show how to do that. Uh, you can also add JavaScript using the script element. And the script element being a script start tag and an end tag. And then 
you just, I think I could actually write in this one, yeah. So I could do something like, I did that last year as well. So when I press tab, everything just disappears. Okay. I will not indent using tab, but that is really hard to remember. Uh, so we could do it like this. The indention will be hard. Console.log. Hey, Sam. This is totally valid. We've added a script element. We have written JavaScript between the bracket uh, inside of the element, and this will uh, log hey Sam to the console. You probably recognize the console log command because that is a command that is, or an API, the console API is shared between node and the browser. And that is because when they designed node, they looked at the browser and did it kind of the same way. So many of the API calls in node are mimicking how to do it in the browser. What will happen in this case is the browser will start parsing the page, it will come to the script element, and then it will stop the HTML rendering and it will execute the JavaScript. When it's executed, it will start rendering HTML once again. Uh, once again. Yeah. So where will this show up? Well, it will show up in the console. So if you are, I've got a Swedish operating system. So it says inspect here, it says ins inspecting English. Uh, if you just right click and, and, and choose inspect, you will go into the development tools in the browser and you will find a console there. Uh, in this case, this is not being executed because it's only presentation. Uh, however, you can also write code in this uh, uh, console. So I can do a console.log ASAN and it will execute the code. And you could do like let i equals 10 console log or we could just do I think i plus 5 and that is 15. So you can like write code in the console. The code is being run in the context of this page. So, so it's executed with this on this page. So we could mani manipulate things on this page using JavaScript code in the console. And if we do this, oh well, it will write in this console. And that is, of course, only for developers. So, so, so this is not, not a user-friendly way of, of, of greeting a user to your page because the user needs to go into the console to be able to, to, to see that. Uh, That is one way of doing it. I might get back to that. It has the same drawbacks as uh, when you, you, you place styles like that. If you have multiple pages, you need to uh, um, duplicate the code on all pages. So you will probably not do that too much, but I have, uh, I have a notion that we might, in, in a certain case, we'll see the script tag once again implemented in that way. However, uh, what we can do, just like with uh, uh, stylesheet, you can use the script tag, you can specify source, and you can point to a JavaScript file, and that file will be executed. In this case, it will be executed when this script, when, when the rendering engine comes to this line, it will say, oh, here's the script, and it will pause. It will fetch the script synchronously from the server. So it will ask the server to send the script. It will receive the script. And then it will execute the script. And when it's done, it will continue to render the page. So there is a reason why the script is located at the bottom of the page. And that is because then we don't interrupt the page load. So in this case, when the user enters the page, it will show the HTML, it will show the ASS, uh, CSS, and then it will load the script in the background and, and add the script to the page. If we were to add the script in the top of the page instead, 
we might get a delay. So, you, so the user will see a white page waiting for the script to load and then it will start rendering the page. So you, you, you will actually get a, 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 a snappier uh, page load placing the script at the bottom. This works in browsers way back. You can do this in Internet Explorer and whatever. And it will still work the same way. I will show another way of, of, of doing this. Uh, yeah, this is the kind of the file structure that I have. So we have a source folder for all the source code. In that folder, I have index.html and I have a source folder called JS. And in that JS folder, I place all my scripts. You can kind of do it like however you like, but this is the way that the exercises are structured. But of course, you're, you're free to change it. Okay, another way of doing this, I think. <laughs> oh, I had that. <laughs> okay, we could play scripts like that. So, when we are just using the script element like that, this is what happens with the page load. So the green bar being the rendering of the HTML and CSS, the blue being uh, fetching the JavaScript from the server, and the red being executing the JavaScript, running the code. And this is, this is what happens when, when you do that. And you see, uh, that's why it's a good practice to place, if you're using the script tag, place it in the bottom of the page, because then all rendering has been done, more or less, uh, before executing and loading, the, loading and executing the script. You can change this behavior in modern browsers. You can add the async attribute, and Adding async will make the script load asynchronously. So, so it will load in parallel with the rendering. So the browser will not stop the rendering for loading the script. However, when the script has loaded, the rendering will stop and the script will be immediately executed. Not that commonly used. It's kind of a special case. A more common use is the defer attribute. So you can place the script element in the head section of the page and the script will load parallel to the, the page rendering. However, the execution of the script is deferred until the, the, the whole page has rendered the first time. We, we will, you, you're, you're jumping ahead, uh, asking about single threading. We will, I have a lecture on only that because that is such an important concept. Uh, we, we don't need to worry about that right now. Uh, no, not everything is single threaded per se. However, this is single threaded. Well, in this case, it's not obviously because the network call uh, is, is, is done in, in one thread and the rendering in another, but the rendering and uh, the execution of JavaScript is always single threaded and that's why you can never overlap and have the rendering and the execution of a script at the same time. But, but we, we will, we're, we're skipping ahead. Um, this works in most modern browsers, maybe not in Internet Explorer, but that is not a modern browser. Okay. Just a quick look at the folder structure. This is how the, the, the folders are, are uh, structured in, 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 in the assignments. Source folder, a JS folder with app.js, a CSS folder for, for the styles and an index.html. Please feel free to change it. However, if you're using Webpack, like we do in the assignments and exercises, you need to change some things inside of the Webpack config. The Webpack config is pre-configured for this uh, folder structure. And this folder structure is even given to you when you, when you download or make a git, git subtree to, to receive a exercise, you will get this folder and those files pre-configured, even though it's more or less empty. Okay, still living in, in, in the notion that we are loading the script using the script tag in the way I showed maybe at the bottom of the page to get maximum uh, compatibility. There is a problem. And that is that everything in, the everything in the browser is global. 
So when you write a JavaScript, it's executed in the same context as every other script on that page. And they are kind of executing together. If you do something like this, let temp equals 22, we create a function called my function, we increase the temperature by 12. Well, that was, yeah. The, ah, I know why. <laughs> Do you, if you look at that code, is there something wrong with that code? Something that I've forgotten, maybe? If you just look at the syntax. A return, yeah, it should probably return, but it will return undefined in this case. I, I forgot to, to in instantiate that variable, right? Yeah, so, so I didn't write let increase temp by 12. I forgot. And that is valid JavaScript. What that does, that is a shorthand for saying make this variable global. So by forgetting to, to, to writing let the var or const before a variable name, it will be global. So if you were to do this, console log window dot temp, this one, temp, it will say 22, because the, this file app.js is executed in the global scope. So it, when I just create a variable like that, that is the same thing as saying window dot temp equals 22. And window is the global object in the browser. Every other script can call window and get the temp. So that is a super global variable. I'm not sure, but I, you've probably discussed global variables in other languages and that global variables is kind of a bad thing. This is even worse because I only forgot, I didn't even mean to make this increase temp by global, but since I forgot to write let or var, it became global. So it's stuck to the, the window object. If this is by design, or actually a fault in the language we could probably discuss, but this is one of the bad things with JavaScript, that everything sticks on the global object. And there is a saying that if you pollute the global object, Douglas Crockford eats a kitten. Um, so please don't, we love our kittens. Uh, you should never place anything on the global object. So, that one. Uh, it's not. It's fault. <laughs> it should say uh, 35. <laughs> no, 34. Um, yeah. I'm not sure why I did that wrong, actually. Yeah, but that, that one is, is, is added. Yeah, so, so it should say 34 and 12. Never ever place anything on the global object. Um, that is just bad practice. Because if you add a username to window and another application running at the same time on the page also needs a variable called username and adds it to the window object, then you share that username and it will, you will get a lot of bugs. And it's just bad practice. But we, we, we shouldn't think about this too much, but know that this is happening. And this is actually fixed by using ECMAScript modules. Because if we are starting to using ECMAScript modules, window, the first, yeah, well, one thing. First of all, if you try this in the browser, it will work. If you write use strict at the top, it will not work. So use strict will prohibit this behavior. That is one thing with use strict. Uh, Okay, so, what, so you always add use strict and you will not get into this bug at least. However, a better way nowadays is to use this called ECMAScript modules, ESM. All major browsers support it. I think we could have like... They changed the UI, as I said, for Chrome. Can I use modules? Yeah, this one. So the support is pretty good. Edge 
Firefox, Chrome, Safari, iOS Safari is supporting it. However, Samsung internet is not. So that is probably, uh, anyone, ha if, if you have like a Samsung Galaxy, is it running that one, Samsung internet as default? Yeah, or are everybody kind of switching to Chrome anyways? I, I, I don't know. Uh, because that is kind of a problem. If, 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 if Samsung Galaxy phones can't, or Samsung phones can't access your page if you're using modules, then you have a problem. But otherwise, the support is really, really great today uh, for modules. Uh, it's a really, really simple trick to, to add ECMAScript modules to your page. You just add type module to the script element. Type module is not recognized by older browsers. And if they recognize, if they don't recognize the type of a script, they will not execute it. So older browsers will skip this, this, uh, this line and will not load that script. But modern browsers will load it. Then we can do like this. Uh, script no module source js old dot js. Actually, I would call it build instead of old. Okay, like that. So you can still add a script at the bottom of the page. You can write the attribute no module. Old browsers will ignore that one. And they will load the build.js file. So you can serve your page with one using ECMAScript modules in a modern way. And then you can have another version that works in older browsers. Oh, that must be hard to maintain. Well, not really, because uh, as you see on, on, on the exercises and the uh, um, examination assignment, we have Webpack, which is a build system that will look at app.js and follow all the dependencies to all modules and create something that works for older modules and call it build.js. So you will not need to think about that. But if you look at the exercises and go into the HTML, you will find this construction. You will find the type module in the head section and you will find the no module at the bottom of the page. Okay, but we have no defer here, right? So shouldn't this like stop the execution of the page, the rendering? No, uh, when you use type module, defer is standard. So you don't need to think about it. If you're using modules, this script will be deferred to the bottom of the page and executed after or asynchronously loaded during the rendering and then executed when the rendering stops. So it's deferred automatically. I've, that is wrong. Should say JS there. Uh, when you look in some examples, you will see the file extension MJS, Michael Jackson script. Uh, but it's called that, and I don't know why, but MJS probably stands for modules, moduled JavaScript. Uh, that file extension is often valid as well. You can use the file extension MJS for your modules if you like. And there is a big debate going on how to implement those ECMAScript modules into Node. And as of, the, as of right now, the recommended way to do that is to, to call ECMAScript modules MJS files and old JavaScript modules JS files. But in the browser, there is no consensus yet. And I've chosen to stick with the JS file uh, extension, and that is because standard JS will not recognize the MJS extension, hence it will not uh, uh, lint your code. So, so, so in this course, I will stick to the JS extension. Uh, but 
you might see code that says MJS on, on some sites. Okay, so what does this, because this is a, a rare opportunity for the browser vendors to fix things that was falsy before, because the only browsers that are able to, to, to run those scripts are modern browsers and, and modern browsers supporting ECMAScript 2015. And that is also a good way because if you, if, if the code is executed in a browser, you know that that browser is a compatible browser. Uh, Internet Explorer, Explorer will never ever run this file because it will not be able to. So it fixes some things. First of all, you don't need to, to write use strict. Use strict is enforced. It's, it's there as a standard. So, so things that you could do wrong in old JavaScript, like forgetting to, to initiate a variable or instantiate a variable, declare a variable, sorry, with let, you cannot do that in modules. You will get a, 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 an error when you're running the code. Top level variables are local to the module, and this is really important. In old in the old way of doing it, the window objects was where all the, ob all the uh, variables got. So in this case, if I created let temp equals 22, it got stuck on the window object. It will not do that anymore. It's more like in Node that it, it's its own namespace. Each and every module is its own namespace. Nothing will leak if you, you are not explicitly telling it to leak. Modules loaded this way is only executed once. If you add the script element to app.js 10 times without no modules, they, the script will execute 10 times and load 10 times, probably cached, but, but anyway. In a module, it's only evaluated once. Uh, so if you, you get some kind of different modules depending on the same uh, a, a common module, it will only have to be loaded once because it will kind of do this dependency tree, tree uh, uh, and see all dependencies and, and plot all dependencies. And it's executed asynchronously. Uh, so this, I, I haven't got, it was late last night. I think it works like this, that if you do, if you inside of a script, uh, if you say that, oh, I want to load another module or import another module, instead of just synchronously wait, it will unload the module and start executing that module. In this case, it will asynchronously load that module, release the thread, we will get back to this, and when it's loaded, it will continue the execution where it stopped. Uh, that is quite important when it comes to the browser because it's single-threaded but more about that later on. Just, just know that there are some benefits of, of using ECMAScript modules. Last week, I showed you how to require an ex module.exports uh, code. So if you're, in a, uh, if you're writing a class, say a, a circle class, and you want other modules to use that class, you need to export it. And in node modules, or common JS modules as they are called, you do that by writing export module.exports and an object that will be exported from this module. And then on the other side, if you want to use the circle, you do a require circle. I showed that last week. That's how you do it in node. And that's how we used to do it in the browser, but had Webpack just abstracting everything away from us uh, or just not compiling that into other code. But now when we can do this natively in the browser with ECMAScript modules, the syntax is kind of uh, different. But I think you will manage. So if you look at this example, we can import from other modules using the import command. And inside of brackets, we could specifically tell what we want to import. It's a long time since I wrote Java, but I've 
kind of think this kind of reminds of Java in some way. Don't you have like important, but it doesn't work the same way maybe, uh, I don't remember. However, in this case it says import a as b. So in foo.js, foo.js must have import exported something called a. And we are telling, oh, in, in my context, of, in context of the page, let's call a b instead. So this says import a as b from foo.js. So then we could do b dot something if it's an object or if it's a, a number, we can just plot b. I mean, a will not be present in this context. We can do an import a from foo.js. This is simpler. We're just saying, okay, import a. I want to use a. I want to use circle from foo.js. And then you can use circle. You can use the star as well. You can import star as n space from foo. Then you will get an object called n space and everything exported in foo will be stuck to that object. So you can do like an n space dot a or an n space dot b or an n space dot c, whatever was exported from uh, foo.js. And if we look, look in foo.js, we export by using the export command. So we have the import and we have the export. In this case, we export a as b. Those are not related. <laughs> because in this case, if we just look at the first line, it says that foo will export one thing, and that is a, but it will be called b. So from the outside, foo is exporting b. And we would have to do an import b from foo to, to get that uh, exported object or whatever it is. You can of course just export a if we like and call it what it's called. And we could even export an expression like let's see. So in this case it will export undefined. Uh, or it will export c but c is undefined in this case. However, how you will use it is probably like this, if you want to use the class syntax. And this is, I think y this is, looks quite clear. Oh, I must forgot. Okay, might work. I'm actually on, this is like, I, I haven't used it, those for more than a couple of hours. So I'm pretty sure you need brackets around, surrounding my class must have forgotten that, I need to change it. But in foo.js we export the class, my, uh, there are so many errors in this one. <laughs> Just a minute, I'll correct it. Da, 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 do. Uh, where is that one then? Too many files. Um, Hope it's her. Oh, it's not. Ah. First one. It should say that. No, yeah, it should. <laughs> Thank you. Any <laughs> any more things I've done wrong? The name of the file? I can't yeah, that is also. <laughs> <laughs> I was tired yesterday. Uh, now I think it's correct. <coughs> okay, like that. So in the app.js, we import my class from the file myclass.js. In certain environments, you can skip .js. However, not in the browser, not that I've managed anyway. So you need to, 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 to specify the file. Uh, you need a dot slash though, in, in the same way as with uh, require, because it, that will indicate that this is not a built-in module, that this is a module that will be loaded from the file system. So dot slash, new class, just to in initiate a new instance of that class. In the myclass.js, 
uh, we export class my class and then we have the class. So it's quite a neat syntax. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can say about uh, import and export because it works in different, completely different way than require uh, does. But I would actually recommend looking at this talk. I think it's a, a, a Chrome developer that talks about uh, how this is done under the hood with the dependency trees and, and circular references and how that is handled. So, so if you want an in-depth look at this, look at that uh, recording. The examinations and exercises are prepared in this way. So, so you are supposed to use this syntax in the exercises. However, if you like, you could use other syntaxes as well. Uh, yeah, just a brief look at the developer tools in the browser. Um, I've shown them already. Uh, you can do a lot of things with the tools. What you need to remember is that when you develop for the web, you develop in your IDE but that the code is executed in the browser. You can set up the IDE or the development environment to debug even with, with a connection to the browser, but that is quite cumbersome. The, the easiest thing is to just debug in the browser itself. So if you, for instance, go into, I'll do it on this page. If you go into the console, you find all of those tabs in the top. Elements we have looked at before. This is just a representation of the HTML page. Remember though, this is not the code you have written. This is an interpretation of the code that you have written. So if you have written false code, false HTML element, uh, false HTML code, this is the corrected version of your code. So if you're kind of looking at your HTML code on your development environment and, and it doesn't match when you are trying to apply JavaScript, a good practice is to also look here and see if something is, is changed because that could, pre could actually happen. You have the console and this is where you just could log things. You will get all error messages in, con in the console. Uh, you might even get sta JS standard errors in the console because Webpack will uh, uh, inject them as errors in the console. Um, so a good thing is to, to have a look here if something is not working. In sources, you find all files in the project. In your case, let's see if we have... Okay, so, so, so in this case we're using a library called reveal and the revealed JavaScript file is here. You will find your files under source JavaScript and app.js and you can look in the files, uh, look at your code and this code will be exactly what you've written. This is not interpreted. Uh, you can add debug uh, uh, or, or breakpoints just by clicking. Then you reload the page and it will stop the execution at the breakpoint. And as you're used to in other languages, you have, now this is really crammed together because I want you to see it, but you have a watch down here. You can add your watch expressions. You can see the call stack. Uh, you have your normal controls to step into, step over. This is exactly like a, a normal debugger. Uh, a simple way of add stopping the debugger as well, if you're writing in your, if I'm in, in, in Wishes to the code and you want the debugger to stop on a certain row, you can always just write debugger. So if you write that statement somewhere in the code, the debugger will stop at that. That will in, in, inject a breakpoint at that uh, line. And that is pretty neat because then you, I mean, if you're sitting and coding in, uh, in Wisher Studio and you know that I want the breakpoint at this line, you just write the debugger, go to the uh, uh, page, reload it and the debugger will stop. You no need to find the file or uh, things like that. So just the, like, the entire browser just stops? Yeah, the browser stops. It, it freezes. 
So the rendering stops at the, I mean, the thread is, is halted. So, so everything freezes. Even the cursor, if, if the cursor was in a down blink or an up blink, <laughs> so to speak, it, it will stay in that position. Um, on the network, you can find all network traffic. This is useful when we are starting to working with network traffic. Well, doing uh, uh, asynchronous communication with the server, using H uh, HTTP request objects, or working with web sockets. And web sockets will be used for, for the chat application, for instance, in the last, uh, last assignment. Uh, then you could go into the network, uh, uh, and you can, you can watch the network traffic and see what is actually going on. Pretty useful. And of course, all of those tabs has a lot of fine tuning you can do and filtering and recordings and yeah, that's a lot. Performance, I will not go into this one, but you could, if you have performance issues with, with, uh, with your script, uh, your game or whatever you're writing, you can start the recording and you can record what is happening, what is eating memory, what is uh, using the CPU or the GPU or whatever. Um, we will skip this total in this course. Uh, the same with memory uh, allocations. Uh, if you have a script that is running out of control and needing memory, you can ex uh, examinate that using the memory uh, tab. What I would like to look into is the application tab, because this one we will use in the course. So under application, you can find detailed information about, for instance, uh, uh, the persistent layer in the in the browser, the the the, the, the data, uh, what's it called? Storage, uh, the storage uh, in the in the browser. So I said we had something called web storage that is local and ses session storage. So if you, for instance, are uh, you are writing um, uh, word processor you, you, or online code editor or something, so the user is is writing code. You really, you would hate it if, if the network connection is lost, the user reloads the browser and all changes are gone. You need a way to store all changes as the user writes in the browser. You can do that using local storage. That, will, that is a persistent layer in, in, in the browser. It's, it's, it's capped, you cannot store two gigs in it. I think it's like 25, 20 megabytes or something like that. But it, it's totally fine for, for smaller use. Uh, you have databases and index database, uh, um, index DB. Uh, though one of those, I don't remember which one, is uh, deprecated um, and will not probably be used anymore. I think it's WebSQL. I'm not sure. I should remember this. You can look. You can look at the cookies that this page has set. Uh, in this case, uh, you can look at the cache when we start working with the cache and we can look at something called service workers that is a really hot topic uh, we will look at that in the uh, later parts of the course as well um, but everything is uh, you, you can look at it here you can clear the storage and, uh, and work with the cache in this application tab that is pretty much what i want to show right now Good. Uh, questions? <coughs> this uh, local storage, uh, how does that compare to cookies in terms of tracking? Uh, so, local storage, how is that compared to cookies, for instance, for use for, for tracking? Uh, local storage is just, just a storage area. It's, 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 a, it's a name value storage area, so, so you have a, a key value storage area. Uh, it's only available for the site that s sets that, the domain that sets the, the storage. So you cannot really use it as, well, or maybe you could if you're... Loading a remote script. Loading a remote script. Uh, we will get into that. Uh, then course comes to play uh, uh, and all of that. So, so more on that on the security. Oh, it's the door on the security lecture. But local storage, yes, just look at this as a simple way of storing uh, data in the browser. However, if we look into the more 
law or rest restricted by the law things. I mean, it's called a cookie law that you are al always supposed to, to tell the user that you're using cookies. It, it, in the law, it doesn't say cookies. It's, it says if you're storing data on the user terminal, then you're supposed to inform. So, so the same thing actually complies to, to, to local storage. And actually, the cache is, is, is I think, uh, an exception. But the laws are really not up to date with the technology in this case. And we will see that service workers, for instance, that's a really tricky business because service workers are actually JavaScript code running in the background in your browser without you visiting the page. Uh, so for that, that is how, for instance, if you are surfing the web, you can get a Facebook notation, uh, a notification, even though you are not on Facebook. And that is because Facebook has a service worker in the background waiting for no notifications. And when a notification shows up, it uses the notification API to show that notification for the user. That is built into Android in a, in a much neater way. So, so it will be native uh, notifications in Android from the browser. But we will talk about that as well in the, in, in the later parts of the course. Service workers are this really, really interesting topic. Uh, and it will change how web applications are designed, more or less. If all browsers uh, implement them. Safari has been like, ooh, but I think it's, 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 it's a green light from Apple as well right now. It will actually, service workers will kind of change the whole app store thing as well, because cert we will be able to create more or less native applications using the web APIs, which is interesting. But more on that on a later note. Uh, okay, so we will. We need a break. We need the kind of uh, an hour and eight minutes break uh, for lunch. Then we will start looking at the concept of DOM, the DOM, the Document Object Model, uh, which is a really important part when it comes to to uh, writing JavaScript web applications. Okay, thank you. <coughs>